Good morning, everybody. I'm Ashley Morgan Olvera with the Texas Invasive Species Institute located up in Huntsville, Texas at Sam Houston State University. And I'm going to be talking to you today about invasive aquatic plants, managing them and reporting them using texasinvasives.org. This was presented to the Woodlands Township Task Force on June 5th, 2021. I'm doing a recording today because we did not record that presentation, but I appreciate you taking time out of your day to learn learn about this, these important plants. So I always like to start at the beginning. What is an invasive species? The federal definition arose through an executive order in 1999, and it's a species that is non-native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So it's important to note that harm is mentioned here several times. And again, it does refer to several things. An invasive species can pose harm in one of these ways, all of these ways, but economic loss can be harm through crop destruction. We have environmental harm through food web and ecosystem disruption, human and animal health because of the transmission of parasites, new diseases, allergic reactions, and then the recreational and social impact, boating, international travel, and that's, those are actually two of the main pathways on how aquatic species are transmitted. But invasive species can pose harm in many different ways. It's important to note that they are usually an exotic species, like 95% of the time. However, we can think a species is native, but it can become invasive as well. One example is the smallmouth bass. It's native to the eastern part of the of North America from Quebec, Oklahoma, down to Alabama, but then fishermen were catching and releasing them into other livable environments. It outcompetes other fishes, it's very predatory, and it even eats other smallmouth bass. So it's cannibalistic on top of that. What it's important to note is that we were catching and releasing. Fishermen were thinking, oh, it's okay, a fish is a fish right? However, that species is native to the eastern half of North America, and now it's found throughout the United States, and it affects eastern Texas and the Edwards Plateau. So we have to be mindful that just because it's found in a certain portion of the United States doesn't mean it's native to everywhere, and if we move it and it starts to take over and cause harm is when it becomes an invasive species. So it's just important side note, not all invasive species are exotic. They can be invasive to that area under consideration if we think about the federal definition. So one example of how um, an invasive species can cause harm and how it's also noted it spreads quickly and that's what we, that's what also invasive refers to is not only its ability to cause harm, but it can spread quickly. And usually that is how it causes its harm. So we have the lionfish, which initially popped up in Miami, Florida, and that happened because an aquarium flooded and a pair of lionfish got out into the ocean. And for a while, it was it's fine. You know, you see from 1985 to 1997, it hasn't really expanded. OK, that's fine. Around then, we're starting to realize what invasive species are and, and starting to wrap our heads around that. I mean, we're still making management issues at this time. Unfortunately, it was left unattended, and now the lionfish has spread all the way from Philadelphia down to Venezuela and is found throughout the Gulf of Mexico. And yes, it has spread, but it has an appetite for destruction. The lionfish is a very voracious eater. It will eat anything smaller than it. And it has the perfect environment in our area because there are no predators that are, are immune to the fact that lionfish are known to have paralytic venom in their spines. It affects 
anything, a jellyfish, other sharks, humans, it's very toxic and de deadly. And the, unfortunately, our large predatory fish are not immune to that. So they're able to go around eating whatever they want. Nothing's eating them. And one of our studies even showed that lionfish in the Gulf of Mexico are actually lionfish out in their invaded areas were fat. They had fatty gill, fatty livers, fatty stomachs. They were just fat. And like, of course, they invade and they're gluttons. What that also means is that they're eating fish that maintain our coral reefs. And so now that they're, those fish are not able to maintain our coral reefs, they get covered in algae and that kills them off. So they're completely destroying aquatic ecosystems that are vital, vital to the sustainability of our oceans. As I kind of mentioned that what came out of the aquarium trade right an aquarium flooded, but how do invasive species spread the main facet is human interaction. We participate in this in almost every way possible. There are several aquatic species we're going to talk about today that escaped from or through the pet aquarium trade. So we talked about the lionfish who have the Chinese apple snail and it's known to transmit angiostrongylus nematodes to mammals and humans where it's native to in China. However, these snails have been present in Texas for almost 30 years. So with them being present, that means the parasite can easily establish. And we'll touch on that later. There's several other species that came through the aquarium trade who have common and giant salvinia. It was used in as aquatic fern, which we now know it invades and destroys aquatic habitats. You have hydrilla, its long distance dispersal was linked to the aquarium and aquatic nursery trade. So how it was able to appear in very different areas of the United States, it was linked to the aquarium trade. It also um, stifles out lakes and ponds as well. We have the crested and yellow floating heart. This is widely sold in the water garden trade or it used to be. It is obviously a beautiful flower, but if you think about if you had this in your pond and, and think about all the rain that we've been experiencing here, especially in Southeast Texas, flooding events are happening. So this is how things can easily spread is you have something ornamental in your yard, a flooding event happens, and now it's suddenly floating down the San Jacinto into all those little tributaries and all those little side ponds. And then that's also how a lot of invasive plants have been, so not just our aquatic plants, but our terrestrial semi-aquatic plants, they were brought for ornamental and aesthetic purposes. The main pathway that many of hundreds of invasive plants have spread to the United States. The Chinese tallow in particular was brought over in the 1700s, Nandina, also known as heavenly bamboo, you easily could have this in your yard. I know my parents did. We've been working on removing that. You have kudzu, which is known to take over many quickly grow even up to a foot a day and it was brought over for its beautiful flowers and then Japanese honeysuckle which is known for its very fragrant flowers. So we have interrupted these species uh, in several ways for many different purposes and now we have to try and manage and counteract what we've been doing. So that's where entities like texasinvasives.org and us at the Texas Invasive Species Institute, also known as TISI, we focus on early detection and rapid response to newly invasive pests, and we want to enhance public education about invasive species. It's so important. Just um, knowing what an invasive species is makes you more aware on what kind of plants you're going to be bringing into your yard or what kind of animals you're going to bring to your house makes you more aware of, um, you know, your neighbors and, and communicating with them and with you sharing with one other person today, that doubles what I've been able to reach today. And that is what's most important. We know that it's 
showing what an invasive species is helps you be more mindful and help uh, be a state steward for Texas in the end. We try to work with groups of all ages because it's vitally important and we know that children can impact us just as much. So texasinvasives.org is officially merged with TISI now. So we are your one-stop shop for invasive species outreach and research programs. As we discussed, invasive species have a multitude of impacts. They impact our natural heritage, our recreation opportunities, our human health, and industry leading into forestry and agriculture. And all of this impacts our economy and our well being. We may. We as state and federal entities are out there doing the best that we can, you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife, use Fish and, wild, uh, fish and Wildlife, um, Texas AgriLife, all of these amazing entities, USDA APHIS with the port checks and the, the border checks, checking all of the imports and exports that come in. However, there's only so many of us and we really need all the help we can get with the control, treatment and monitoring of invasive species. And that's where valuable people like you come in, where you can help us report, manage on your local level, manage on, managing in your own property and being aware of that is such a, a it's, it seems like it's a small impact, but it's an important step and making large steps. And especially with the Woodlands Task Force, y'all really put it to work. And so that's where it's so important for us to have days like this. So thank you again for attending and tuning into this. We're now gonna start discussing invasive plants in your area. And often remember that you're, you'll see, we'll talk about the arrangement of stems. So you have alternate versus opposite, simple leaves versus compound, whether it's world, the shape of the leaf, is it lanceolate, is it chordate, the margins, is it serrate, lobate, palmasect, is it what color are the leaves? Do, are the leaves hairy? So it's often going to be a suite of characteristics that'll be listed and which you try to check everything off the list to help guide you to whether it's this invasive species or not. And thankfully, uh, quite a few of them will be identifiable and you can always reference um, the quiet invasion at galvebayinvaders.org and always reference texasinvasives.org. We have species profiles that list um, identification characteristics and management practices that you can employ. So you can always reference both of those for identification references. So there are several established invasive and semi-aquatic plants in your area that I want to touch on. There's the Chinese tallow, which several of you might already be aware. Honestly, this one you'll see everywhere. Uh, you also have the giant salvinia, one of the most infamous ones, elephant ear, hydrilla, and water hyacinth. Then we'll also discuss some that are are not quite in our area or they're newer to Texas. So it, it's important to you know catch it early, manage it early and also report. We have the Eurasian, Eurasian water mill foil, floating hearts, we have the crested and the yellow. And then we have the tropical spider wart as well. So the first one is the Chinese tallow. And this tree has a significant advantage on us. It was brought over by colonists in the 1700s for or ornamental purposes because it has beautiful foliage. I mean, it is the only tree in our area that changes colors like, um, like for the fall like nor the Northeastern states would. So it was brought for ornamental soap and seed oil production. Unfortunately, it can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. It grows rapidly. So before, th before we knew about invasive species, if you think about that's what makes a great plant, right? It's easy to manage. It can quickly take, it spreads, it's beautiful, but that's also what makes it invasive. It can produce an abundant amount of seeds that are spread by birds and it may lay dormant in the soil for up to five years before germinating. So that could also mean long after you've removed the tree, there's seeds that are easily going to keep that could easily germinate and, and try to 
regrow. So they can spread by sprouting from the roots, especially when the original stem is cut or the top is killed. So you have to definitely do a cut and treat treatment with Chinese tallow where you cut it and immediately apply herbicide and a surfactant. It's a uh, and you'll have to do it repeatedly. It is a very tolerant tree. And it also is able to change the pH and the soil around it because of the seeds. The, these white waxy seeds are covered in these outer shells and all of these seeds and shell covers have a lot of tannins in them and when they drop into the water or they drop into the ground around them they start making the soil more acidic more ideal for the tallow to persist and kind of edge out all the native trees so that's why once you start noticing chinese tallow you'll start noticing chinese tallow everywhere and it's really found a good home in the Houston area, especially I think at one point I remember the canopy might have been reported about 80% um, Chinese tallow. And so it's, it's important that yes, it seems like it's everywhere, but knowing what it is and trying to manage it at least, you know, removing one more off your property, that's a big step. And so it's easily identifiable. It has kite or heart-shaped leaves. And then it also has these seeds that I mentioned, but initially it starts with their flowers, which are catkins. They usually have the females at the lower base of the catkin and the rest are male flowers. Then those developed into three lobe capsules, fruits that are green that usually dry out and they have these tannin filled outer shells and these white waxy seeds which are often eaten by birds or they drop into the soil and those shells oof, they hurt when you step on them if you're ever outside barefoot. Um, but so this is a good suite of characteristics on how to identify the Chinese tallow. We'll talk a little bit more on management when we get into some of the herbicides and treatments that you can use. It does start as a small little seedling, but it can easily grow up to 30 feet tall and three feet in diameter. It can definitely grow rapidly and tall. The next plant, this is a fully aquatic plant. This is giant salvinia. It's actually a free floating aquatic fern native to Brazil. It was intentionally brought as an aquarium and water garden plant. And then it was also unintentionally introduced to the United States as a contaminant in the shipment of other aquatic plants. And this happens quite often, um, especially with, uh, if you think about seeds, right? Especially if you heard about those random seeds being shipped from China. But that's why now it's really important if you want to buy a grass mix or a wildflower mix, it's important that you're getting from a native source, a local source even, of, you know, a, a, there's plenty of Texas wildflower seed companies and such like that, because you're ensuring that you're not accidentally receiving and spreading an invasive species as well. But this is a lot of how things spread it. And we're now trying to mitigate these efforts through education and, um, and detection. So it was first found in South Carolina in 1995. This map is from the USGS on non-indigenous aquatic species website. We'll see these maps quite a few times. As you can see, it's widespread throughout our area of Texas. And then here's a close up for the Houston. And then up here we have Montgomery and Lake Conroe. So it is noted in Lake Conroe. And for these USGS point maps, the larger the blue circle is, that means the more points there are in that location. So it's found in the Houston County Reservoir, Lake Conroe, Lake Livingston, Sam Rayburn Reservoir, Sheldon Reservoir, the Lower Trinity. Um, so it tends to invade lakes and it will, it's a free floating fern, so it'll have two leaves above the water surface. Those leaves are oblong or, you know, more oval shaped. They end up being about an inch and a half, an inch and a half to half an inch in length. 
Underwater, there's one leaf that modifies into small root-like structures, which is pictured right here. So remember that it's free floating. We don't have an aquatic fern that is native to our area, to Texas, that is a free floating aquatic fern. So that characteristic itself is identifiable. The problem is that it um, it will form maps, mats. And while it's only about two inches in depth, it can grow on the surface of the water. It will completely block out the so sunlight, which depletes the oxygen in the water, contributes to fish kills, the death of zooplankton. It's It can completely smother an entire lake and the aquatic ecosystem beneath. It can be confused with the invasive common salvinia, but it can be differentiated by the leaf hairs. So if you'll notice here on this, on this, you can tell that the leaf almost looks like a Velcro structure. So it definitely has hairs and it ends up those hairs are actually little egg beater shaped hairs. So if it's egg beater shaped, it's giant salvinia. If it looks, if it's another free floating aquatic fern, right, F free floating aquatic fern, but it has open hairs that almost kind of look like a little succulent or a little cacti spine, right? If it has open hairs, that means you have common salvinia. However, in our area, we're more than likely going to encounter giant salvinia, but this was posted by the Louisiana Fish Wildlife and Fisheries Department. It's a great visual aid as well. So these are the characteristics for giant salvinia to keep in mind. And then if you do encounter common salvinia, it should be reported as well. However, um, this one is not, is not as invasive or harmful and giant salvinia is persistent in our area. The easiest way, and this is why you will, you'll hear this message consistently um, because it is the easiest way that you can um, learn more and help prevent and help by encouraging your friends and all of that, that clean, drain, dry. Parks and Wildlife has been pushing that message because that's why it really is important that you clean your equipment, your boats and your vehicles you can always reach USDA APHIS for more information. TexasInvasives.org, we have a great partnership with Parks and Wildlife, and you can look at their Clean Drain Dry campaign and learn about more what you can do. But it's really just being a mindful boater and hiker, all of those kinds of contributions. If you're out enjoying nature, it's just making sure you're not taking nature with you. Uh, physical removal can be difficult since they can re-sprout from fragments. You'll also hear that phrase from me as well. But if it's a small amount, definitely always try physical removal. It's just important that it can be really difficult. Many of these plants do uh, re-sprout, but we do encourage it. There are several herbicides that are effective. It is vitally important that you are mindful of the impact it can have on your aquatic habitat below. Say you have a small pond and it's completely covered in salvinia and you know nothing is below. Well, then, you know, you can treat however you, you need to treat that um, with glyphosate, with diquat, with flamuxazine or fluoridine. Um, that's your private property. You know, you're aware that nothing's under there. There's minimal threat. But you have to be mindful of what if that pond flows into your, somehow when it floods, it gets connected over to your neighbors. And so we've got to worry about drift as well when you're applying herbicides. And also, this is not exactly ideal if there is a large um aquatic ecosystem going on underneath with fish and vertebrates and other invertebrates and insects, but it does work. It is effective. You just have to be mindful of could it impact other water bodies? Will it impact what you have going on below the salvinia? It's just being mindful and, um, you know, following the instructions as well on the, um, 
on the bottles themselves following those recipes and not treating too much. Also, this is very exciting though. Giant Sylvania does have a biocontrol that up in Caddo Lake, they've been doing a lot of research. Uh, Parks and Wild, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Louisiana, Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries, they've been doing a lot of research about the use of Salvinia weevils as a biocontrol. And it has been making good progress in Caddo Lake. And so thankfully, they are looking into being able to share this biocontrol with other people in the state. Uh, legislature had changed recently to where they might be able to ship these out to citizens that have Salvinia problems on their property. It could be used more widely, you know, like with San Jacinto River Authority might be able to use it at Lake Conroe as, you know, just being able to have other entities using this as a biocontrol. It seems like the legislature is lightening up on that. It might be able to be available for transport. I do know that us at uh, one of our researchers at TISSI, we are applying for a grant to hopefully help facilitate in that, um, you know, getting the biocontrol to concerned citizens or property owners that have a Salvinia issue or help facilitating other entities with using this. So some of these do have biocontrols, but it's a matter of it being available. And we have it does take a while now for these things to be released and be approved because we're trying to learn from our mistakes as opposed to just introducing it saying, oh yeah, that's the predator from over there. Let's bring it over here. That'll solve it. We've learned from our mistakes that, that that's not how it works. But this is very exciting um, and you should definitely keep an eye out for Salvinia weevil distribution. So the next group are elephant ears. There are three gene genera that encase elephant ears. I mean, there's hundreds of species. Um, and we'll just talk about some of the identifying characteristics in them. It's pretty consistent amongst the three genera, Alocasia, Colocasia, and Xanthostoma. They are a tropical species that's widely used in the gardening industry. They grow from tubers called cormels. One of them is often referred to, one of an elephant ear species is the taro root. So if you've ever seen taro root at the grocery store, that's what a cormel is. So it's vitally important that if you're trying to remove elephant ears, you have to get those cormels up and out of the ground. And you know, it's surprisingly difficult. And also these stems like to snap and you have, because they're not, they're not very hardy, they're quite spongy. So you have to be careful because they are poisonous and will cause skin irritation. So uh, it's not recommended to cut, but if sometimes if that is the only way for you to be able to effectively manage where you have to cut and apply herbicide, just please make sure that you are wearing protective gear. Um, it can cause skin irritation. It makes it feel like you have insulation on you, a really sharpie glass feeling. It's, it's uncomfortable comfortable. So just make sure you're wearing gloves, long sleeves, and just use extra care. They're invasive in warm climates, especially if planted near water. So they start to invade the natural waterways and their root systems start clogging up the shallow water. And this changes the water flow. So it can change the, the speed of the water and it can change the the ability for animals to exist in that water because there are certain insects and fish that they they reside in riffle areas right where the water has to flow fast and over rocks and it sounds really specific but that's how it works where some live in the slow moving areas and so when you start having a plant encroaching on it and growing through the aqu aquatic environment it starts altering everything else around it. So one of the species is cola, or one of the genus is Colocasia, and it's a native to swampy areas of Asia. It spans over 200 species. Um, the leaves may grow up to three feet in length and two feet across. The heart-shaped leaves can reach eight feet in height, and they're 
on long rigid petioles. So those are the petioles that I talk about that they, they snap and that's where you have to be cautious. That's where the irritating fluid is when you're dealing with them. Alocasia, these ones produce calla-like lily blooms and they tend to have arrow-shaped foliage and the leaves tend to point upright on the petioles. So they often are called upright elephant ears. Um, there's about 70 species of alocasia as well as dozens of hybrids. And it's because the appeal of their leaf form, color and sizes. I mean, these are still widely used in, or widely found, widely used gardening industry, but it's just about being mind, now that you know what it is, maybe making a, a, a change in your landscape or um, being able to help manage the landscape at, within the Woodlands Township. So these can vary greatly depending on the size from two feet to 15 feet tall, on average, about six feet in height. And then you have Xanthosoma. These ones are often referred to as the taro root. So the, the Cormel is our important food staple. It usually requires temperatures above 68. So you would think ideally the freeze would knock them out, good riddance. But oftentimes if that Cormel is able to still survive, then it will re-sprout under again. So the arrow-shaped blades typically have decorative veins and their flowers are similar to those on alocasia. So those calla lily like blooms. They're pretty all, I mean, elephant ears are pretty obvious, pretty unique. Uh, so easy enough to spot. It's just careful when you're treating them. You know, you if it depends on where you're Treating, you know, here it says do not cut, but that's just definitely to be a precaution. Um, if you're using pr protective gear, I mean, you you might need to cut if you're trying to get through this kind of brush. You know, here this is um, USDA Agri Agriculture Research Service, like they're able to treat and they probably manage this water body. So you can use herbicides. It's just always being mindful of one that's approved for aquatic use, not over treating because you have to be aware of drift and your environment. And, and, you know, you can always try physical removal. You just have to be very cautious with the skin irritation, right? Like um, you don't know if you, you might have an allergy. It already causes irritation on anybody, but it, what if you have an allergy and it causes a severe reaction? So it's always important to be careful. Um, and usually a combined approach of cutting and applying herbicides can be very effective. Um, but just keep in mind, if you're treating something on your own property, that's one thing. But if you have, you know, say you have a creek that runs through everybody's area, you may not be able to treat your area with herbicides because it, it can affect everybody else downstream. So it's just keeping that in mind when controlling. The next one is hydrilla. So this is a fully aquatic plant like giant salvinia, however, it's rooted. So it will grow from the ground up. It's, um, it has two version, two different strains. You have the dioecious strain, which was, was from Korea and the monoecious strain from India. And they were introduced in two different ways. So the dioecious strain was imported intentionally in the 1950s for the use of aquariums. And the monoecious strain was a separate introduction and it was first found in the Delaware area and the Potomac Basin in the 1980s. So the monoecious one that was intentionally brought for aquarium, or I'm sorry, the dioecious one, it was first detected in Florida. And as you can see, it is found throughout Florida. It has taken up many areas in Texas that feed into also Mexico, even through California. So hydrilla has been able to spread far and wide throughout our state and throughout uh, the eastern half of the United States. So it's a submersed aquatic plant. It's profusely branched and it's an herbaceous perennial with stems that go up to 20 feet long so it and it's an obligate wetland plant 
you'll also hear this phrase from me as well several times this is how they often their harm is they invade lakes ponds rivers marsh marshes and other types of wetland habitats and they're invasive because they're able to grow aggressively competitively and this um hydrillus spreads very efficiently through shallower areas and they can grow up to one foot a day so that's much quicker than our native aquatic plants and much quicker than any um you know if you think about fish that are eating our aquatic plants if that plant's growing a foot a day that can be hard for them to keep up if that's not the kind of amount they're used to so dense mats will restrict the light much like giant salvinia except for as opposed to being free floating they're rooted in the ground and growing up so like this picture imagine a it's not only blocking the light from the top but it's also mass just taking up all of that water column and it can reduce the light availability for submerged plants and aquatic invertebrates. It depletes the oxygen levels, causes fish kills as well. And hydrilla has been shown to alter the physical and chemical characteristics of lakes. And that's usually due to the decline of zooplankton and phytoplankton in the water because those zooplankton and phytoplankton they exist in that area for a reason and they help create a fine balance and once they're gone it throws everything off to where only the hydrilla persists and all of those animals that feed on that zooplankton and phytoplankton are no longer able to continue that's why we have the fish kills and all of the invertebrates are also dying as well it starts from the bottom up so in our area, it's mainly the dioecious version. So that's the one that I'm going to discuss. It's, you'll hear the word whorl several times when we're discussing hydrilla. So that's the leaves going around the stem in a whorl. They're bright green. The whorls tend to be three to 10, but five is the most common, as you can see here in this line drawing. But right here, we have this picture next to it where we actually have five or six leaves on this whorl, but the one above has five. So it's just, you know, Keeping that in mind, we're also going to compare it to a native species and show the differences between that. So five is the most common on the whorl, and it has small teeth or serrations on the edges at the tips. The, and there it tends to be a reddish center spine, but it's hard to see in pictures. One of the most identifying characteristics is the small white to yellowish potato-like tubers. So these tubers are unique to the hydrilla. So if you're not sure what it is, um, which in the next slide we'll compare it against the native species, but if you're not sure if it's hydrilla having, you know, say this has only three serrated leaves on the in its whorl and then you pull it up and you see a tuber that will help confirm it's this characteristic suite that makes up hydrilla so they form up to six inches deep in the soil and can be difficult to dislodge so that's how hydrilla can also be it's very difficult to remove it physically because you may be removing the plant but six inches deep into the soil and we're already talking about in a pond i mean how do you how can you ensure that you dredge up i mean if if you have tractor equipment or um you know you're able to scoop it out that that's fantastic but most of these water bodies that we think of that that's quite difficult to do especially since these hydrilla can grow up to 25 feet in length so this slide talks about it shows a comparison between the invasive and native species and this is provided by uh, the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants University of Florida they have a great program out there as well. This is our native Elodia the American Elodia and it's important to note this one always has three leaves on its whorl always three and never serrated does not have a toothed edge. Our invasive hydrilla and our invasive Brazilian aloidia always have more than three. And if you do encounter a hydrilla that only has three, 
always look for that serration because the native Elodia, it's smooth, always smooth. So the hydrilla is normally more than three, usually five, always serrated. And it has that small visible spine. So it's pictured down here, but remember it's hard to see in the photos, but, but it's there. <laughs> So that's how you can tell the difference. So these are both invasive, but you will see American Elodia and this one's fine. It belongs there. The, our native species doesn't grow as rapidly. It doesn't smother. Now, if it's on your property and you realize like, you know, I, I, there's a little bit too much of it, then, then feel free to manage accordingly. But do keep in mind, we do have the native Elodia, and, but it is always three and always smooth. Same prevention and outreach, please clean, drain, dry your equipment. I mean, a small fragment can start a whole new invasion. That's how these things are so invasive, is their ability to persist despite obstacles. And that's what makes them very difficult to manage. And so prevention and outreach is really our focus. Treatment, um, like mentioning with those tubers being deep in the ground, physical removal can be difficult since they re-sprout from, from fragments. Diquat is an effective herbicide. Uh, that's supposed to say a 37.3% solution. A biocontrol, so you have prob probably heard of the grass carp. So hydrilla has been an issue for quite a while and grass carp as a biocontrol was introduced after that. However, that was also a learning point for invasive species management because unfortunately they were introducing diploid or sexually reproductive grass carp into these environments. And grass carp were having a field day. They're eating up all the hydrilla, they're getting happy and fat and they're reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. And then unfortunately they're re reproducing at a faster rate than the native species that have been like suffering and or are not lo no longer there because of the hydrilla these grass carp started taking over the aquatic environments. So lesson has been learned. Now they introduced triploid or sterile grass carp. This is the method that the San Jacinto River Authority uses in Lake Conroe. It has been very effective. They do use triploid grass carp now, and that's to, you know, allow the fish to live and persist, but to not displace our native species. Like we need them there to help manage the food and they can live long and happy lives eating the hydroa all day, every day. We just don't need them reproducing in environments where they shouldn't be. So that is an effective biocontrol that, they try to establish in certain areas. Sometimes it can be hard to get it to get the grass carp to be successful. The next species is the common water hyacinth. It's native to South America and it was sold back in the 1800s as an ornamental for fish ponds. As you can see, it I mean, it has beautiful flowers. So when you see some of these species, you understand how these species spread. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful, but I thought that this was really an interesting story since its introduction back in the 1800s, it notoriously interfered with navigation, including covering railroad trussels, that Congress authorized the U.S. Corps of Engineers to address the problem through the River and Harbors Act of 1899. So they said, this is a problem. Clear this guy, clear this water hyacinth right now. And I think that that's such an interesting fact, but then it also makes you wonder, but how quickly 
did legislature then say, oh, we shouldn't be selling this anymore, or it shouldn't be, you know, that wasn't exactly what they were thinking back then. They just said, hey, this is an obstacle. We need to remove it. And now we have to be like, hey, this is an obstacle. We need to stop selling this. Or, you know, you see it in the wild and you bring it back to your pond. Like, right, we need to just be more mindful of what we're doing and try to get legislature to catch up. It's now found in 35 states and it's widespread in Texas. So here again, we have that USGS point map. Remember the bigger and bluer the dot, the more reports there are. So there are plenty in Houston and a Huntsville call. So definitely uh, common water hyacinth is in our area. It also invades lakes, ponds, rivers, and marshes. It quickly forms dense floating mats of vegetation and it can double size in two weeks. So if you think about, you have a two foot patch, two weeks later, it's a four foot patch, then an eight foot patch, then a 16 foot patch. It's just that that keeps going and going. And so it, since it's also, it's not a fern like our giant salvinia, but it is a free floating aquatic plant. It also, creates dense mats that restrict light to the underwater environment. So same effects, kills off the aquatic invertebrates, depletes the oxygen levels, can lead to fish kills if it's in that environment. The leaves are oval to elliptical and they can be up to six inches wide and waxy with their petioles. These petioles are nice and spongy and the leaves curl upwards, as you can see, they kind of almost form a slight funnel shape, but the leaves curl upwards. The flowers are, are quite lovely. They're showy blue purple flowers on upright spikes. Each flower has six petals with the uppermost having a yellow patch. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And the uppermost or your noon position on that flower has that yellow patch on the one, two, three, four, five, six. So, I mean, it's quite lovely, but unnecessary. Uh, unfortunately, if it was just lovely and not an invasive species, it wouldn't be on this list and not a problem. It is, has also been spread um, not just through the aquarium trade or the ornamental water garden trade, but also, you know, it's reached our natural areas or our recreational areas through boats and trailers. So please remember clean, drain, dry. There are some effective herbicides out there. Uh, again, um, physical removal could be difficult, but if you find it early, always try, always try for physical removal. Right now, there's not really any biocontrols out there. Um, and many of the common herbicides are effective. Just always please be mindful of the aquatic en environment you're working in. The next one is, so now we're entering into ones that are not um, widespread in our area. So we definitely want to have you help us keep an eye out for them, try to report them, please, uh, which we'll talk more about later in this presentation. So the next one is the Eurasian water milfoil. And as the name suggests, it's native to Europe and Asia. And um, its long distance dispersal has been linked to the aquarium and aquatic nursery trade. So much like the other ones, it has been spread as well. It is one of the most widely distributed of all the non-indigenous aquatic plants. It's found in 48 of the United States. It is not found in Hawaii or Wyoming. It's widespread in Texas, but it's not documented in Southeast Texas yet. And that could be that it's genuinely not here, or it could just be that it hasn't been reported. I mean, again, there's only so many of us that 
at, you know, at the USGS or here at Texas Invasives or with Parks and Wildlife that can help look for that. And that's why citizens like you, if you're able to, you know, send a photo and report it to us, that can help us fill in these gaps. Just knowing, is it here? Is it more widespread than we thought? So the harm caused by the watermill foil, it competes aggressively to displace and reduce diversity of native aquatic plants. Each plant produces over a hundred seeds. So, you know, their, their ability to grow fast, produce a lot of seeds, helps them get an advantage over native water, native mill foils, which we do have native mill foils as well. They're tolerant of low water temperatures. It quickly grows to the surface, forming dense canopies that overtop and shade the surrounding vegetation. Canopy formation and light reduction significantly reduce native plant abundance and diversity. So they're out there changing the diversity of plants available to those aquatic invertebrates or, you know, grass eating fish and everything. And that's changing their nutrients, the makeup that would make maybe they don't survive. Maybe, um, you know, water milfoil doesn't provide the same amount of nutrients that the native plants do. And, and that can change um, not only the plant abundance, but then change the diversity of the animals able to live there. Uh, and then of course we do have the same issues of it, the canopy formation and light reduction that would affect the oxygen levels and the animals below. So to separate it from native mill foils, it's as a rule, the Eurasian has more than 14 leaflet pairs per leaf and reduced bracts on the inflorescence. So not as many branches on the inflorescence, but the 14 leaflet pairs they're referring to are these pairs here on the leaflet. So there's gonna be more than 14. And then the small yellow four and then they had these in this line drawing and here you can faintly see they do have small four parted flowers that rise above the surface of the water from the terminal spike. And the male and female flowers can be found on the same inflorescence as pictured here. Unlike many aquatic plants, this species does not produce turins. So it doesn't produce dormant vegetative structures that survive the winter. And the plant fragments can be tra transported via winds, waves, or human activity. So human or animal activity, right? If you have deer walking through the water or birds, you know, or store um, egrets or heron, herons landing and, and moving around. But it's important to remember that the invasive one as a rule has 14 pairs of inflores, or um, sorry, 14 leaflet pairs per leaf. Same prevention, clean, drain, dry. Physical removal, again, can be difficult because of re-sprouting. You can use systemic or contact herbicides on the Eurasian watermill foil. Just remember that systemic herbicides are taken up within plants, killing the leaves, stems, and roots. Contact herbicides <clears throat> damage or kill only the parts of plants which with they come into contact. So, you know, if your watermill foil is fully aquatic, then you need to think about what's in your water system um, and how, you know, how you can put in triclopyr, a systemic herbicide might be more effective than a contact herbicide because you want to destroy it from the root down, but you need to be just aware of what effects triclopyr might have on um, the other organisms in your pond. Or, you know, if the water mill foil is completely taken over the area, then that's something um, that would you know, require a stronger treatment. But again, we have not even had this documented in our area, so reporting it will be important as well. They have used uh, another biocontrol, a milfoil weevil has been used in the North 
northeastern United States. It's native to that area. So that's why they've been able to use this biocontrol. And they have had success in New York, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Vermont, and Wisconsin. So that's very exciting. But it is one of those, you know, that weevil's native to up there. Um, we don't necessarily want to bring it down here. And, and what if it starts eating our native milfoil? And then we have an issue. So that's why um, that's exciting for them up there. But um, distribution of a milfoil weevil is not being talked about in Texas yet, like a salvinia weevil is. So the next ones, again, these have not uh, been reported just yet. Uh, or there, there's very few reports, I apologize. There's very few reports of these two floating heart species. You've got Nymphoides cristata is the crested and Nymphoides peltata is the yellow floating hearts. They're both native to Southeast Asia and they were brought as ornamentals for fish ponds. They first started to um, escape, which it would be the yellow floating heart first started to escape and was detected in Winchester, Massachusetts in 1882. The yellow floating heart, since it um, was brought over and started to spread earlier, it, it's more widespread. In reference to our state, it's found in central and north Texas. And then the crested floating heart is, could be found in our area. So now we'll kind of go into, yes, they're in the same genus. They have very similar, I mean, they're, that means they're very closely related, but there are some differences. Um, the yellow floating heart, we do not have a, a native plant that has a, a native aquatic floating heart that has a yellow flower. So this one should be, easier to identify, but we'll go through a few traits to help you confirm it. So as the name suggests, they tend to have heart-shaped leaves, but the yellow floating heart has more rounded leaves that are opposite. So directly across from one another, they're unequal in size with slightly wavy edges and the undersides of the leaves are often purple. On the right here, we have the crested floating heart, Nymphoides cristata, and those leaves are more heart-shaped. They are alternate, so not directly across, and the edges are often tinged, uh, have a reddish tinge to them. So you can see here, sometimes it's a faint, like it's a line. Sometimes that tint is starting to take over the leaf. So the yellow floating heart leaf size is smaller than the crested floating heart. And remember, it ends up looking more kind of like a smushed heart, like a, an un, like a roll of dough almost. Tried to be a heart, but then it got smushed. While the crested floated heart, the leaf shape is a little bit more chordate. And it has that reddish border to it. You'll notice it has a solitary flower and that's how you'll help separate it from the native species. But before that, we'll compare the flowers and how you can help identify. So the yellow floating heart, we so it, it's a floating aquatic plant with a yellow flower so that, uh, that's already kind of catch our attention. And then if you look, if it's a five petaled flower with distinct fringes, so here you can see the flower as a whole, and then a little bit close up where it has that distinct fringe, that helps you confirm you that is the yellow floating heart. The other invasive crested floating heart here on the right it also has a five petaled flower, but it is a white flower and it's also has fringed edges, but what helps distinguish it from our native species, which I'll show on the next slide, is it has this ruffled central crest. And that's why it's called the crested floating heart because it has this ruffle crest right down. So here on the yellow floating heart, there's no crest. So that's right where the ruffle appears here on the crested floating heart. 
And then remember the leaves also have that reddish tint. So this flower will look similar. There is a native Nymphoides species, Nymphoides aquatica. It's native, it's the big floating heart. Its leaves tend to be much larger, much heart, more heart-shaped. They don't have that reddish tint on the, ed the edges as well. So remember our invasive one over here has that ruffled crest on the flower, the reddish tint on the leaves. But our native one here has also has white flowers, but it will not have the fringed edges and it will not have that ruffled crest. And it tends to have more, oh, sorry, it tends to have more than one flower. Crested floating heart always has a solitary flower. Our native floating heart can have clustered flowers. It will not have that ruffle ridge. It will not have the fringed flowers. Also, both plants are known to have tuberous clusters. So these are almost like they're root-like structures that dangle from the leaves underwater. So you can see them here underwater. And then when you pull up the plant, this is the invasive crested floating heart. You can see the they tend to look more finger-like or these are kind of narrower, but then this is the native. So this is the same big floating heart, same native species, but it's also called a banana plant, but it's still Nymphoides aquatica. And it's called the banana plant because its tubers are wider and definitely look like plantains or bananas for sure. So they have the wider roots. So that can help you separate as well. You know, if you're unsure, do I have the native big floating heart or the invasive, you can pull it up and do its tubers look obviously banana or are they kind of more of a fingerling or, you know, not quite the same. That can help confirm it as well. What help you separate it between the two species. The next one. This one's kind of more semi-aquatic. It's found more in like your, your cropland areas, but it's important just to look. It could be found in, you know, your roadside ditches and those types of areas. So it's just important to note because it, especially with all these flooding events that have been happening, it can easily spread. Um, this is the tropical spider wart. It's in the spider wart family. It's native to Africa and Asia. It was accidentally brought here. Seed contamination, its seeds was mixed amongst those that were intentionally being brought over. Um, it was first found in Florida in 1928. Currently, it has not been reported in um, Texas. However, you know, that that's this one is on our Sentinel Pest Network reporting and it's because we want to quickly track it so then we can quickly remove it and help prevent it from causing any damage to our agricultural aspects. So this is a federally, federally listed noxious weed. So this is one you cannot sell. So that's great, right? It can't be accidentally or sold anymore, but unfortunately it impacts nurseries, croplands. It tends to be herbicide resistant. It can transmit a root nematode. So just like um, humans can get nematodes and animals can get worms, so can plants. It just depends on what kind of nematode. And oftentimes these, uh, crop nematode pests can kill off entire plants, uh, soybeans, your corn. So it, it can have a very large impact to where this plant is helping the pest spread to the crops. So not only is the plant itself a threat, but it can potentially bring a nice little nematode with it as well. So the plant overall kind of, it, it, it not terribly unique, you know, it's not as obvious as, as Chinese tallow or something like that, but there are still a few traits that can help you um, identify it and definitely when it's flowering. Uh, however, if it doesn't have the flower, one of the 
best traits that'll help out is the red hairs on the margin of the leaves and the stem. So the stems get about to three feet in height. They're fleshy, there's root at the nodes, and then you have the leaf blades pictured down here. They're ovate to lanceoliptic in shape. They have an alternate arrangement. They're about three inches long to one inch wide. So they alternate kind of around as a whorl, but you can see the alternation, but the red hairs on the leaf sheaf is going to be important. So they can have open or closed flowers. This is how it can be hard to remove them. When they talk about closed flowers, what they really mean are these are like underground flowers. So they're never open. They look like swollen nodes and they reside underground. And so if you're pulling the plant, but you're not getting that underground flower out, the plant's going to be able to re-sprout from them. Again, remember an invasive species is invasive for a reason. <laughs> if it was easy, we wouldn't talk about it so much. But the open flowers are very distinct, thankfully, because you know the plant overall is, except for the red hairs on the leaf sheaf, the plant overall is pretty general, kind of hard to confirm. So the open flowers, these are the ones that would be above ground, they're aerial. So the, um, the petals, it'll have two bluish purple petals and one white petal. These bluish petals are on long pedicles. So really long, almost kind of make them look like bug eyes or, or antennae or something, but really long pedicles. And that'll help separate it from native species, which we'll discuss in a couple slides. So you've got the underground flowers and the above ground flowers that will really help with identification. So there are Texas native lookalikes. You've got the, the typical spider wart. So while our invasive species is called a tropical spider wart, you'll notice that it doesn't look so much like a, this spider wart as it looks like the day flower. And that's because tropical spider wart is actually a day flower genus. So it has a typical day flower structure where it has the two prominent petals and the third is less prominent. However, you notice it won't, it doesn't have those long stemmed pedicles. And then the triple, the typical spider wart just has three large petals in general. So this is where it, remember it will, this one might confuse you, but it's important to remember in our invasive one pictured right here, it has those long pedicles while, while our native species does not. So there are two um, native day flowers that you might see that could catch your eye and then make you pause for a second. You have the white mouth day flower and the false day flower, which was used as the previous example, but it's just always important to note the coloration and then the length of those petal pedicles. <laughs> They're much shorter, much more directly attached to the stamen as opposed to the tropical spider wart. So that's really going to be a distinguishing trait. So the next slide we're going to talk about, so this is the one animal I'm talking about today, and that's just because you have probably seen this animal, you've easily encountered it, and there's just a little um, extra education we want to put out there to talk about the human health threat that it poses and how you can report it and what you can do to help lower populations. So this is the apple snail, uh, can often be referred to as, uh, you know, the Chinese apple snail, which it's not exactly, not, some are not from um, China at all. They're actually from um, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina. Um, Pomacea maculata is this species pictured here. It can often be confused with other apple snails. However, all apple snails in Texas for us are invasive. Apple snails are very large, so they are easy to identify. And we'll also talk about um, 
other life cycle stages that'll help you identify them. So much like um, the lionfish or pythons, <laughs> the primary transmission was through the pet drain. It's attributed to aquarium dumps in Florida. So they're now found throughout the southeastern United States. And right here, I've got the USGS point map. I've got it zoomed in for our area. So you can see it is very well documented. It was actually first reported in the Buffalo Bayou area in Harris County in 2000. So we've known it to be present in the Houston area for 20 years. And it's also been present in the San Antonio area and San Marcos area for, for almost as long as well. It's now found in 10 watersheds in Texas. What I wanna point out in the distribution is last year through our citizen reporting efforts, um, we've been able to get some reports actually in the Woodlands area and then some reports out in the Beaumont Orange County area where um, it makes you realize that they're there's probably a large gap in distribution that we're missing here. So we're trying to do more work to track its distribution because of um, its ability to transmit nematodes to mammals. So as mentioned, it's a fully aquatic snail. It's larger than any native snails. On average, the apple snail shell is going to be about three inches wide. And wide I'm talking about from, because it's a spiral shape. So we're talking about just kind of the, the width across the front. They get about three to four inches wide. Sometimes you could see six inches, but that would be including the length of the snail itself. Um, so the adults live underwater, fully submerged, and they only come out of the water to lay eggs on vegetations or structures above water. This life cycle stage is going to be the easiest way to identify because it, it can be very hard to see the apple snails. I mean, especially if it's a hot summer day, the water's getting shallower and shallower, they will bury under the dirt. And so you may not be able to see the adults, but if you see bright pink eggs laid in clusters, that means you have an apple snail problem. And, um, please squish any eggs that you see. So the harm alert is that this snail species is known to carry Angiostrongylus cantonensis in Florida, Hawaii, and Louisiana. And I know you're like, Ashley, that's just a bunch of words put together. What this worm is also known as is the rat lungworm. And so it's called the rat lungworm because traditionally this species grows in the lungs of rats and then continues on in the infection. So angiostrongylus nematodes require a, a rat and a mollusk to complete their life cycle. So they need two hosts and this means they have an indirect life cycle. The problem is that parasites like these angiostrongylus nematodes, they are very, very persistent and they will try to infect anything that they can. And the thing is that many things eat snails and slugs, not just rats, right? You have raccoons, armadillos, dogs, cats, right? Many things um, eat these and can accidentally contract the angiostrongylus nematodes. And that's where it comes into a human health concern. What that means is that humans can accidentally contract this parasite as well. So how it normally works in the rat's life cycle is the first stage comes out in their poo, the snail or slug comes into contact with the first stage larva, the larva then go inside the slug or snail, the mollusk, and they molt, they grow. They go from a first stage larva into a second stage, and then they become the infective third stage larva. And what infective means is this is the stage where it tries to find a mammal, particularly a rat, to then go infect. And the way that it does that is by, once this slug is eaten by a rat, 
this will molt into an adult, go into their lungs and start the life cycle all over again. What that means is that then it'll go into the lungs, it can reproduce, it'll be happy schmappy, and then the first stage larva come out and the life cycle continues again. However, as I mentioned, other mammals get involved in this, and sometimes it's humans. And this, this worm is typically called Angiostrongylus cantonensis because it was first discovered in China, where eating apple snails and slugs, uh, rare or undercooked, is often common and that's how humans were coming into contact with these parasites. They were eating the infected mollusks undercooked, the worms then enter our body and then they're trying to find the right place to reproduce. The problem is we're not a rat so they'll go into our brain or they'll go into our stomach looking for the right habitat. And I know that that sounds terrifying. You're like, Ashley, you're talking about brain worms right now. But the thing is, we are not the correct host. So the parasite will not reproduce. We will not have adult females. You will not have adult eggs or, or have eggs being laid. The, the life cycle will not continue. They will die inside of us, but they can cause damage while they're trying to migrate where they're trying to go. And you're like, Ashley, you're still talking about brain worms. What, why are you telling me about this? Well, it's just because we need to be aware. It's very, very preventable. Now, I know here in the United States, we do not tend to eat undercooked slugs or snails. However, we do tend to keep slugs or snails as pets. We do tend to have outdoor gardens where slugs and snails are crawling all over it. We do tend to eat crustaceans um, like crawfish or shrimp that could have been in the same habitat as these mollusks with the parasites. So the thing is that We've had these mollusks in our area for a long time and the parasites are starting to appear. So we just have to be more mindful. What that means is we should not be bare handling slugs and snails. Please do not keep them as pets. If you do end up touching them, it's very, very easy to prevent you getting this parasite. It's so easy. All you have to do is wash your hands before you touch your mouth. Wash your hands like COVID has taught us for 20 seconds, warm soap and water. And that's why it's important. So just don't bear hand, don't handle any snails or slugs. If you do, wash your hands before you touch your mouth. If you do have garden vegetables or fruits, just wash them. Get a vegetable wash or dilute some, you know, some soap and, and just wash it well for under warm, you know, kind of lukewarm water for 20 seconds, just making sure that you're washing everything thoroughly. And then if you are eating any crawfish or something like that, or, or you like frog legs and you caught the frog yourself, just be careful and make sure it's cooked thoroughly. And the reason is because sometimes these these critters end up getting infected accidentally because again, these parasites are trying to complete their life cycle absolutely any way possible. So this is something to be aware of. The parasites are appearing um, in Texas. So we just, you've got to be careful. Make sure that your kids are not handling any slugs or snails. Make sure your dogs and cats are not eating just as a precaution, because what if, right? What if it is carrying it? So it's easy just to be preventative. And now that you're aware, you can help share this knowledge because it, it's easily preventable. We just have to wash our hands before touching our mouth. And thankfully, that's something that everybody's learned after COVID. So it's easier to keep that message going and just making sure that, you know, you're aware. So if you are out and about and you see these pink eggs clustered, please squish them. 
we do have signage that we worked with the Dallas Zoo and Texas Parks and Wildlife to create some educational signage. So if you have, um, we're trying to spread out the educational panels, but if you know some areas that would be interested in us um, putting this up by some of the water bodies in the Woodlands Township or outside, or if you know anybody out in East Texas that can document this, please, please, please let us know. But if you see eggs, squish them, squish them, squish them, squish them, cut that piece of grass and then just stomp, stomp on them please because if you think about it you are reducing hundreds more from hatching in just that one small act especially since it is um so hard to actually catch the adults and remember they cannot be legally sold in aquarium stores in texas so if you see anybody selling please let us know we'll give you more information on that in a few slides so first we're going to talk, we're going to just kind of recap again about invasive plant management. It's important to think about best management practices. Please refer to texasinvasives.org. We do have these references under our species profiles that you can look at, you know, is a mechanical or physical removal an option? Are there biological controls that you can use? Like, you know, we're, we're, we were talking about the salvinia weevil. We're hoping that that's gonna start getting shared amongst citizens um, through parks and wildlife and other entities. So making that more widespread for everyone to use as a management. Always remember with the chemicals, beware of drift, wear protective gear, we need to be careful around aquatic habitats. Remember, some of these might require a licensed professional to use. If you can't, if you're not able to buy it, then that means that someone has to be licensed to use it. We always recommend integrated pest management where you're doing a mixture of mechanical, biological, and chemical, whatever you can. It definitely has to be integrated. It's important to treat early and treat often, monitor, right? Try to remove those extra tallow seeds, um, preventing any re-sprouts, things like that. Repeat, repeat. And then I know the Woodlands Township has a great initiative about removing invasives and then planting natives in their place because yes, we still need the greenery and, and that support for our ecosystems. We just need the right things present. So again, we've got the aquatic example for our elephant ears. So we had touched over this on if you'll be able to, you know, it depends on where you're trying to treat. Is it a moving body of water? It does it affect somebody else? You know, is that an owned, you know, is, is it under the jurisdiction of a river authority or under the city or somebody else? You know, is, is that water, you know, owned in a way so you've got to keep that in mind but also keep in mind about the environment um you know the aquatic environment you're dealing in to avoid drift and um always use protective gear especially with elephant ears but especially if you're you're cutting and doing herbicide please 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 um please remember that elephant ears do cause skin irritation but you're also dealing with herbicides Our tree example is the Chinese tallow. So as I had mentioned, uh, there is a cut stump approach. Um, it's vitally important that as soon as you cut the tree, you have that herbicide ready to go within a minute. Um, all these trees, plants in general, but especially these invasive species, once they're cut, they will start trying to heal and seal themselves off. And if you wait too long, then that herbicide won't penetrate as deeply as it's supposed to, and you'll end up having to do it again and again. So it's just really important that you cut and then treat. Um, oftentimes, if we're working on public property and we have a volunteer group, um, usually, you know, uh, us at 
us at Texas Invasives, we're not licensed to do the herbicide application. So we're oftentimes the ones cutting, but the city employees or somebody will be following immediately after where we're cutting and then they are coming right behind and either painting or directly spraying that herbicide so that we're, we're minimizing drift as much as possible. We're giving a really focused treatment and you know we're trying to be as efficient and as effective as possible try to remove seedlings from the entire root system they can those seedlings can have really long um roots and remember cut trees left untreated will grow back with several branches emanating from a single stump so you'll end up getting three trees for the stump of one these are just different ways to apply. So, you know, you have foliar application, this kind of wide sprayer, you know, this may not be ideal in an aquatic environment because that can cause a lot of drift. You do have basal bark where you um, paint the base of the tree and then the cut stump treatment. And this is what I was talking about where you cut and immediately apply. You can always use a paintbrush. You could use a spray bottle. You can um, obviously, or use a, any kind of method to put that on, but it helps focus it if you use something, you know, if you want to use a paintbrush or a smaller spray bottle than or nozzle than may what come with the herbicide, whatever um, works, it's just vitally important to put it on right after you cut. So a few uh, herbicides that we had talked about today that were mentioned, um, again, it's important to read the instructions on the actual herbicide itself. Each one's going to be different. A 41% uh, percentage of glyphosate tends to be really good for managing invasive species, um, but it can get in, oftentimes this is to be diluted with water. Again, follow the recipes. They will talk, sometimes your herbicides need to be diluted with water. Sometimes they need to be diluted with or combined with a surfactant or a basal oil. Triclopyr tends to be one of those ones. A basal oil, you may sometimes hear people say, oh, well, I mix diesel fuel with my herbicide to treat my Chinese tallow. Yeah, you definitely can. That diesel, because it's so oily, it acts as a surfactant. And a surfactant or basal oil, it's just there to help the herbicide stick to the plant and get absorbed faster. So yeah, diesel is a great surfactant, especially for something as obnoxious as a Chinese tallow, but it's important that you're doing a really focused treatment because you don't want to spray triclopyr and diesel over everything, right? That's where you want to do the cut and direct stump approach. Always wear appropriate safety gear, but again, follow, you know, the instructions. Sometimes they are diluted with water. Sometimes they're com combined with the basal oil. You have a mazapir, which is often referred to as arsenal. This one is uh, harmful to hardwood tree species. So it doesn't readily break, break down in the plant. So it's good at killing large woody species. So this one wasn't referred to as much with our aquatic plants, but it can be effective. It is very effective with Chinese tallow. Um, but none of you know none of them like require a mazapir as the treatment so this one you know it's just to be mindful of okay if if i have you know you have a a ton of oak trees and and you've got you know say you've got elephant ears surrounding the base of your oak trees and you're spraying arsenal all over well if if that that type of um, herbicides harmful to your hardwoods, then you could be hurting your oak trees as well. So it's always just be mindful of what's around and, and what these also are known to harm. Again, that, that's why the cut and paint approach or direct spray is, is good on minimizing drift. So the second to last thing we'll talk about is I did touch a little bit on the Sentinel Pest Network and reporting at Texas Invasives. And I'm sure you're like, Ashley, how do I do that? Well, the Sentinel Pest Network is actually um, a certain part of the TexasInvasives.org website. So it actually focuses on increasing the probability of early detection of pests of regulatory significance. And so these are pests of high regulatory significance. 
And what that means is these are pests that we know will cause problems if they show up, if we allow them to just spread willy-nilly, they will cause problems. So they're ones that we want to detect early. And if they're already here, they're ones we want to keep a close eye on to make sure that they, again, they're not just having free reign of our state. Um, but these are they're ranked by the APHIS um, PPQ, the Plant Protection and Quarantine Agency, and it's because they're plant and pests that can create an economic impact on the nation's natural resources and agriculture. So these are ones that we know will have a problem. And so we've streamlined a our reporting efforts to cover some of these pests and plants because we want everyone to help us keep track of it. And that is our sentinel pest. You can find it very easily in our report it function. So this is the texasinvasives.org homepage. These are our sentinel pests right here. You can scroll. There are 24 plants and pests listed on the sentinel pest network. It does not require a login to sign up to help us report on this. Um, several species that we talked about today are sentinel pests, the giant salvinia, the crested and yellow floating hearts, the tropical spider wart, the apple snail. Those are all sentinel pests that we want you not only to try and manage, but definitely report to us as well. So you can easily do that by clicking on, scrolling and clicking here, or you can go to the take action tab and then click on report it and you can scroll our webs the web page there for one of the 24 species that you're trying to report. Again, does not require login to do this. Because these these pests we really want to keep an eye on so we want to make it accessible to everybody to help us out. So when you click on report it, this form will pop, you know, this form will be at the bottom of the page. It'll have a little bit of information on the pest, and then you'll see this report form. Please, please give your name and email. If you don't want to give everything else, that's quite all right. What is important is your name, your email, the coordinates of where you are, you know, where you're reporting it, and then uploading a photo. Those are vitally important. But please know that if you are sharing this information with us, that is not public information that is shared just for us. Um, but it is important to have your name, email, so we have someone to get in contact with, so we know how to get in contact with you, the coordinates, and then uploading a picture. When you want to choose your coordinates, you just click the choose location, a map will appear, and then you move the pinpoint to where you're talking about. Those coordinates will auto generate automatically in here. And then you would upload a file. Right now, we can only upload one picture that, and it cannot be larger than two megabytes in size. That's um, current website restrictions. We are moving and updating the our web reporting capabilities. So hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be able to provide, you know, you can upload more than one photo. It can be larger than two megabytes, but currently at this time, that is a limiting factor. So keep that in mind when you're uploading the photo. Maybe your photo is too large for right now. Um, please upload the photo and then click the, I am not a robot. And then it, that report will be sent to our um, email immediately and we will then send it to experts or help um, identify it right there if our experts are there. So it's important to remember uh, if you are willing to report a species, um, remember that the pictures are used for validation and you can only submit one right now. So it's important to just send us one that shows the characteristics to help us identify what you're talking about. Please try for close-ups. A contrasting background is always very helpful. This is an example of one of like the best photo. Like this is a fantastic photo. However, this guy is also used to taking pictures of insects. And so um, what's just important to note is that he sent me a photo of something in focus. And while we do not expect this kind of quality all the time, um, 
it's just everything was in focus he and i knew what he was reporting and i was able to identify yes this is the invasive red streaked leaf hopper thank you graham you know so it's it's just important that we don't expect this kind of quality but a photo like this is difficult for people to identify you know what what plant species are you trying to report did you put that information in the report it form when you were sending it in to us, you know, are you reporting the vine? Are you reporting the tree? And it's not a close up, so we can't, you know, we're trying to validate things based on photos. So we have to have a relative amount of certainty, yes or no. And with this, we can't be certain. So then we can't validate it, validate the photo or the report. This photo is better, right? It's providing a close up. We've got a contrasting background. This one's giving the hand as like a size reference. Here we're seeing the um, the seeds, which it might be a which is an identifiable characteristic for that plant. So that helps us out as well, because you know if you're sending a picture of just you know the the winterized dried up version of the plant, well that's that's gonna be hard for us to confirm or deny, because again we have to have a, a strong amount of certainty when we're validating something based on a, a photo. This is a really good photo. You know, again, the, the animal is fully in focus and, um, and, and that helped me identify, I could see the collar around its neck. So it helped me determine what species, but just the creature being in focus is usually the most important part. <laughs> again, just please focus. And also, while I get that they are probably reporting this large tract of, of grass, I think it's just, yes, this photo's in focus, but I, I can't make out enough characteristics. I have 2020 eyesight, but I don't know what they're trying to report there. And I cannot, with a great amount of certainty, confirm the species that they're trying to report. So that's where it's good to have maybe a piece of paper to hold up behind the blade of grass and send that in to us to help. So one of so that is how you would submit information to us. And then um, Please, if you are interested during this summer, we're doing it for the summer. We're having an aquatic invasive species aquarium watch. Uh, we need your help, right? Please be our eyes in these pet and aquarium stores. If you are interested, please contact us. Um, we want to look uh, at aquarium stores to see if they are selling uh, aquatic invasive species that they are not supposed to be selling. This does not require any confrontation on your end. All we would need you to do is go to a store. If you see, um, we first contact us, we'll send you a list of species to look for. You would let us know what stores you're going to check out. And then you would just update. If you find a photo of those invasive species, just take a picture of it, send the email to us at invasives at shsu.edu and let us know. And then we would report it to Parks and Wildlife. They would consult with the game wardens and it would get handled from there just to make sure that these aquarium stores are being held accountable, right? Um, that's, that's how we can help make a large impact in this. So, you know, are they selling sucker mouth catfish, water hyacinth, which we covered today, zebra mussels, water lettuce. So these are um, the species that we would be looking for. And a few of them we did talk about today, the common and giant salvinia, the Eurasian water milfoil, the floating hearts, the water hyacinth. Uh, zebra and quagga mussels, you know, some of these sound, you know, we've known them to be invasive species for a long time, so we shouldn't expect to find them, but it never hurts for you, uh, for us to keep looking because, you know, earlier this year, there was an accidental transmission of zebra mussels where they were being found in moss balls at aquarium stores where no, they were not selling zebra mussels themselves, but they were found in moss balls. So if you are interested in helping us with that, please contact us. Help us stop the spread of invasive species. It, 
it really comes down to you and us working together. Please report any of the pests that we talked about today. You can report them at texasinvasives.org. Like I had uh, mentioned, you just go straight to our, our home page. You can report it that way. You, If you have seen other invasives that you can't do a sentinel repair, you can't report through Sentinel, please email us at Texas Invasive, or I'm sorry, at invasives at shsu.edu. And then if you have any other questions, feel free to email us at invasives, or you can email me at my personal email. It's arm001 at shsu.edu. Please contact Terry MacArthur with the Woodlands Township for more information. We did have links in that other presentation. So um, please uh, reach out to her for more, but you can always go to our website, texasinvasives.org. You've got the galbayinvasives.org, which is another great reference. And um, if you want help confirming any of your invasive species, just please check our Sentinel Pest or email us. Thank you so much. I hope you'll have a great day and please reach out if you have any other questions.